Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this World Council of Credit Unions COVID-19 Response Committee webinar, a virtual Asian financial symposium, the economic impacts of COVID-19 on credit unions. I said good morning, it is afternoon, I know, and for some of you in uh, Korea and other places. Uh, this presentation, this webinar is brought to you today in conjunction with the Asian Confederation of Credit Unions and the National Credit Union Federation of Korea. Today's agenda includes introductory remarks, by Ilanita Senroke, many of you know her as Lenny. She is the CEO of the Asian Confederation of Credit Unions and a member of World Council's COVID-19 Response Committee. We'll then have a presentation on the global economic consequences of COVID-19, a multi-country analysis by Dr. Kamir Mohadis. He is an economist at the Cambridge Judge Business School at the University of Cambridge and a fellow in economics at King's College, Cambridge. And our keynote speech today will be on the impacts of COVID-19 on the economy of Asia by Prajit Chatterjee, Senior Equity Strategist for, for Global Emerging Markets and the Asia Pacific Equities Managing Director for UBS Global Asset Management. Just a couple of housekeeping notes for you today. Dr. Mohada's presentation will be on video, but Prajit Chatterjee and Lenny Sen Roke are both giving their presentations live. So if you have any questions for them, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and type them in there. If you go to the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A button and you can type in your questions there. I'll be asking Mr. Chatterjee and Ms. Senro questions at the end of Mr. Chatterjee's presentation, so towards the end of the hour. Also, today's webinar is being recorded and it will be available later today on the World Council YouTube channel. That's at youtube.com slash woku, YouTube dot com slash W-O-C-C-U. So we're going to start with Elanita Sanroque. She is the CEO of the Asian Confederation of Credit Unions, an associate member organization of the World Council. She's worked for ACCU since 1995, joining the association as the manager for member services. She was eventually promoted to lead ACCU as a CEO in 2014. Ms. Sanroque is in charge of developing programs and business solutions that address the needs of ACCU member organizations and credit unions. And as I mentioned, she is also a member of the World Council COVID-19 Response Committee. Ms. Senro. Thank you very much, Greg. Welcome. Uh, the Asian Credit Union Movement thank the World Council of Credit Unions for appointing the COVID-19 Response Committee chaired by our very own ACU president, Mr. Yoon Sik Kim. The webinar is part of the committee mandate to inform leaders of credit unions on the impacts and responses of, to the pandemic and also share best practices. According to the World Bank, global extreme poverty is expected to rise in 2020 for the first time in over 20 years. As the disruption of the COVID-19 compounds the forces of conflict and climate change, which were already show, slowing poverty reduction progress. The World Bank stated that COVID-19 is estimated to push an additional 88 million to 115 million people into extreme poverty this year, with the total rising as to many as 150 million individuals by 2021. We should remember that they are you know, the members and potential members of our credit unions. We hope that this webinar could help us act appropriately on our recovery efforts as a movement. It is important to be well informed on the global economic impact so that we could find the best strategies to advance our efforts uh, to recover. My humble request is to focus our efforts on the recovery of members it will resonate in the recovery of our institutions. We need to remember that the members are the credit unions foundation and the members defines the success of our credit unions. I wish you all very fruitful session with our distinguished speakers. Thank you very much for joining this webinar and be safe. Lenny, thanks so much. And your message is well taken, I think, because obviously in the credit union world, you know, doing what's right for the members generally is what's going to end up being what's right for 
the credit union. So I think a lot of people who are, are watching today take that message to heart. Up next, we have a video presentation from Dr. Kamier Mahadas. He is a macroeconomist at the Judge Business School at the University of Cambridge and a fellow in economics at King's College, Cambridge in the United Kingdom. His main areas of research are applied macroeconomics and global and national macroeconometric modeling. He is also a consultant at the Asian Development Bank and has previously worked as a consultant at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia. He is also a regular visiting scholar at the International Monetary Fund. His presentation on the global economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic was recorded during World Council's virtual global financial in symposium in November. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Greg, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to talk uh, today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our work on the macroeconomic consequences of the of COVID-19 and uh, and uh, really and basically describing why I think is a bit of a different shock and what sort of what sort of recovery we should be expecting in the next uh, couple of uh, quarters till the end of 2021. So the world has seen many crises over the last few decades. We had the oil shock in 73, 74 due to the OPEC oil embargo. We had the 78, 79 oil shock due to the Iranian revolution. We experienced the global financial crisis in 2008, 09, which, which is probably fresh in everybody's um, memory. Uh, but this time, uh, the shock is very different. And uh, for the first time since the Great Depression, the world is experiencing a global shock like no other. Um, it, it involves uh, simultaneous disruptions to both supply and demand, and it's happening in an interconnected world economy. So on the supply side, as you know, infections reduce the labor supply and productivity, the lockdowns uh, uh, and business closures and social distancing measures taken in almost all countries uh, uh, cause supply disruptions. On, on the demand side, the layoffs and loss of income from quarantining, from unemployment, and worsen econ uh, economic prospects uh, due to a reduction in household consumption and firm investment uh, have obviously a huge impact. And on top of that, we have an extremely, extremely uncertain uh, information about the path, duration, the magnitude, the in and, the, and, and overall, all of these things make the impact of the uh, pandemic very severe and could in fact create a vicious cycle of dampening business and consumer confidence and, and tightening financial conditions, which could in itself lead to further job losses and reduction in investment with potential implications for even long-term growth. So how do we quantify this uh, economic effects uh, of the COVID-19 shock? Well, the key challenges for all policymakers and uh, any empirical uh, economic analysis of the COVID-19 shock are, you know, in my opinion, there are a number, and, and one of them is how to identify this unprecedented shock, uh, how to account for its non-linear effect. We know that extreme events have non-linear effects. Uh, how do we consider cross-country spillover? This is not just an issue happening in isolation in one part of the world, in one country, in one region. It's a global event. And how do we basically quantify the uncertainty surrounding any forecast that, will, that we would be given, uh, given that it's unprecedented? So in a recent study with colleagues at the Dallas Fed International Monetary Fund, uh, Un University of Southern California, and, and John Hopkins University, we, we try to address these, uh, these questions. And in particular, uh, we offer what we think is a unique identification strategy of the COVID-19 shock where we use the GDP growth revisions of the International Monetary Fund in April and June 2020 and compare them to their end of 2019 forecasts uh, to identify the COVID-19 shock. The argument here is that uh, nobody could foresee the impacts of the COVID shock in December 2019, um, even our, our colleagues at the International Monetary Fund. So, I want to give you some of the results that we have. Um, the, the, the way to read these figures is basically, these are counterfactual results uh, for, and give us some indication for what would happen 
uh, what, what happens uh, relative to the absence of the shock between 2020 Q1 and end of 2021. So the solid lines, if you can see them, there are the median responses and the bounds, the uh, different colors, they, they represent the range of likely outcomes, the uncertainty. So the, obviously the uncertainty around these uh, forecasts are pervasive because of the severity and duration of the COVID-19 pandemic, global spillovers, financial market volatility, the ability of uh, policy actions to protect uh, households and firms, and, and the success of the what we've now heard, pharmaceutical uh, interventions to contain the spread of the coronavirus, not just in particular countries, but, uh, but globally. So what these results tell us is that the COVID-19 pandemic would leave the 2021 uh, Q4 uh, GDP about three percentage points uh, lower than what would have been the case in the absence of the COVID-19 uh, 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 pandemic. Um, and you, um, you might notice that the, uh, the negative impact on advanced economies is particularly large. And here I'm thinking about the UK and the, and the US. And for advanced economies, the effects actually in our sample range from two percentage points below the pre-crisis uh, pre path uh, of GDP by the end of 2021. And that would be in the euro area to six and a half percentage points uh, in the United States. So this is quite, it's quite large uh, impacts on the advanced, on the advanced economies. Um, among emerging markets, uh, the impact varies substantially. Uh, uh, the impact of the COVID shock varies substantially. Uh, and this is mainly because in addition to the domestic shocks, so here is health crisis and the lockdowns. Uh, these countries have also been facing, as you know, a range of external shocks. So plunging trade, uh, collapsing tourism in many, many countries, heavily dependent on tourism, uh, capital outflows and falling commodity prices for the major commodity exporters have been a, a, a disaster in some cases. Uh, although these impacts are also, also varies uh, ac according to what type of country uh, we're looking at. Um, but the effects also depend on their economic structures, obviously. Uh, so some countries will uh, rely very heavily on certain sectors as opposed to others. Um, so emerging Asia, actually excluding China here, uh, the first graph, uh, is expected to be less affected by COVID-19 than Latin America, say. And this is mainly due to higher um, uh, commodity dependence of, of Latin America in particular and, and, and tighter financial conditions, but also because we've seen in Latin America, uh, the countries have been su uh, less successful uh, than emerging Asia in containing the pandemic. So this is, this is very important. And as you know, workers in some sectors such as travel, tourism and hospitality services are disproportionately affected by the COVID shock. And, and low-income households actually in, within these countries uh, tend to suffer much more uh, because they don't have access to healthcare and, and they have limited savings to, to name a few. Um, and as I said, countries or regions that rely heavily on oil revenues, tourism and exports of goods and services are particularly vulnerable. So uh, for instance, in the Middle East where we have you know, very high oil dependence, uh, and Latin America, as I mentioned, commodity dependence and tourism in, in, in lots of the countries uh, in the world. What about China, you may ask? So uh, this is a photo of the Wuhan uh, Maya uh, Beach Water Park. I think it was the second week of August, 2020. I, I mean, who would have expected in March that in Wuhan, thousands of people would be packed shoulder to shoulder with no face masks? Um, I, I quite like this photo because it illustrates how different really the Chinese experience has been compared to uh, most of the rest of the world, in fact. And in terms of the speed of the economic recovery, China is an exception, and I, I, I would uh, suggest because of three reasons. First of all, the country was very successful in, uh, in, uh, in sort of um, uh, uh, dealing with the pandemic. Uh, in fact, most of the country had reopened by uh, early April. Um, it has lower size of inward spillovers. And I think most importantly, as opposed to the global financial crisis, 
uh, the COVID-19 shock uh, hit services globally much harder than manufacturing. Obviously, in services, it is much more difficult to socially distance than it is in manufacturing. So that, I think that, that was a, that, that these three are the important thing that was happening in, in China. I want to take the other extreme, which is China dealt with the, uh, with the COVID-19 shock very effectively. In Sweden, we do an exercise where we look at in Sweden and we say, what would have happened if the COVID shock occurred in all of the countries in the world. So that's to the, to the, the first graph uh, in color. And the second uh, graph in black and white shows you what would have happened if the COVID-19 shock had not, uh, uh, you know, or, or the COVID pandemic had not uh, affected Sweden. And what you notice is if you compare these two graphs, what they tell us is the importance of spillovers uh, and mainly through disruptions in global supply chains, travel, tourism, and, what it tells us as well is that no country can shield itself from the adverse economic effects of COVID by following less stringent lockdowns. And this is mainly because of the interconnections and global nature of, uh, of the shock. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't think that being less stringent, uh, actually economically we might benefit. In, the, in that sense, there is no trade-off between health and economic outcomes. Uh, we also look at uh, long-term interest rates, and we notice that long-term interest rates in advanced economies in the medium term could fall by 100 basis points below their pre-COVID uh, lows. And this is because the obviously crisis raises precautionary savings and, and dampens investment demand. However, a word of warning, the same cannot be said with certainty for the emerging market economies where borrowing rates can increase rapidly. Um, so uh, a word of caution in terms of the emerging economies. Uh, in, in August 2020, Bill Gates said that the COVID-19 pandemic will be over by the end of 2021. Um, while it might be true that with these three um, looks like successful vaccines, uh, which hopefully will be on the market very soon and distributed uh, to, to people around the world, uh, might end the pandemic by end of 2021. Uh, our counterfactual analysis suggests that the effects, the economic effects of the pandemic are going to be large and they're going to be persistent and they're going to be negative for the, for the world economy and no country escaping here. It looks like China and emerging Asia will actually uh, do better than the, in the near term at least than the, than the rest of the countries. Um, and uh, where, whereas also non-emerging non markets are actually particularly vulnerable. Um, I, want to, I want to conclude with saying that our findings uh, really highlight the importance of comprehensive and coordinated uh, policy responses to the pandemic and any global shock, in fact. And for, in this case, it would include a, 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 a swift deployment of medical resources, now that, including the vaccines that we've seen by by the three vaccines that seem to be successfully uh, successful. So, and we also need to think about policy interventions in the case that uh, restoring to restore financial markets, the function of financial markets is extremely important. We also, in the meantime, need to also maintain uh, support for households and firms. So even though these vaccines will roll on the market, this, the, the, the economic uh, impacts will not end there and there will be uh, we will see them in the next few quarters, if not to the end of 2021. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And again, that was uh, Dr. Kamir Mohadas. He gave that presentation at World Council's first virtual global financial symposium in November. You can kind of tell because you mentioned that vaccines may be on the market soon, and we know now that they're starting to roll out on the market, but uh, certainly gave a very wide 500 foot view of the entire economic situation as it relates to COVID and how that's affecting the world's economy. Um, and now for our keynote speaker who will add to that. Uh, Projit Chatterjee is a senior equity specialist within the Emerging Markets and Asia Pacific Equities team at UBS Global Asset Management. He has primary responsibility for overall product positioning and development of emerging markets and Asian equity strategies, as well as the marketing and communication of these strategies to existing and prospective clients globally. He is a member of the Emerging Markets Equity Strategy Committee and is based in Singapore. Mr. Chatterjee, welcome. Thank you, Greg. And uh, thank you everyone for attending this session. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be able to share our views with all of you. 
uh, Professor Mahades already gave uh, an overview of uh, an economic outlook for emerging markets in Asia. So I'm going to try and focus a little bit more on uh, you know, certain trends within Asia that uh, we see getting stronger because of the COVID outbreak and trends that one can invest in. Um, so we go a little bit beyond the economic outlook. But starting with the economic outlook, and we summarized, it, summarized this in the first slide, is the fact that undoubtedly the economic hit, the immediate economic hit was uh, very severe, uh, but the recovery too, as you just saw from uh, Professor Mohade's slides has been quite sharp, particularly for China, but now also for other Asian countries. The news of vaccines certainly helps and the rest of the recovery is a little bit dependent on how the vaccines are rolled out but most definitely there is going to be a strong recovery from an economic perspective next year. Uh, expectations are for a emerging Asia, for China, 8% around in the 8% range, right? So pretty, pretty good recovery. The good thing was that Asia entered this year going into the crisis in a pretty healthy state. So there was little excess capacity in Asia. There was room to ease policy, both on the fiscal and the monetary front and company balance sheets were sound. So despite the hit that economies took from the COVID-19 outbreak, this outbreak also uh, actually accelerated certain trends that were already ongoing in Asia. So we've been seeing uh, a consolidation in a number of industries where the bigger and stronger players have actually benefited. They've become bigger and stronger. So there's been a consolidation across many industries. There's been a shift from offline to online across a number of business segments. May, and we are very well aware of that, right? I mean, this session itself is testament to that. People have been shopping more online. People have been gaming and playing more online. People have been studying uh, more online. And people have been uh, doing financial services more online. So the acceleration from offline to online has happened certainly across a number of business segments due to the COVID outbreak. Investments in R&D, technology, innovation, and automation, which we're increasing anyway, uh, have also a picked up pace. So people are now more conscious about automating their workflows, uh, factory workflows, safe distancing norms, uh, which we've been following over the last uh, you know, few months, might actually become rules going forward. Uh, companies have been spending a lot on upgrading their tech infrastructure so that employees can work from home. Uh, and in general, tech spending, R&D spending, automation spending has gone up. Uh, last but not least is the shifts in the supply chain, in manufacturing supply chain, in uh, you know, import substitution, in self-reliance that we are seeing due to various factors. The COVID outbreak is just one of them. US-China relations are another one. Rising costs in China are another one. So there is a reconfiguration of manufacturing and supply chains, which is underway. So these are the interesting trends to kind of observe and uh, you know, for us to be able to invest in. Asia equity valuations going into the year were also quite inexpensive. Uh, they were kind of at historic average. They took a dip down up to March and then they had a very strong recovery. So they're slightly above historic average right now, but currencies are quite cheap. But given the, uh, the geopolitical, geopolitical issues that I mentioned, US-China being foremost, uh, also the pace of recovery driven by the outbreak and vaccines, there is likely to, uh, to be market volatility. Uh, but this actually, from an investment perspective, uh, provides us with uh, a lot of opportunity for active management to pick stocks uh, which are undervalued and vice versa. So if you look at our you know, Asian equity portfolio, the key exposures have been and remain to these structural trends that I talked about. So an increasing share of discretionary spending and premiumization, uh, digital transformation, uh, offline to online, increasing spending on R&D and technology. And lastly, what I didn't mention was financial inclusion. So all of these points are something that I will be uh, talking to you about in a little more depth, starting with the economic hit that the economies took and the economic recovery that they've had, which you can see on slide two, uh, the picture shows you uh, what a sharp downturn many, economic, many economies across emerging markets faced and uh, how they have subsequently recovered. China leading the way, as you also saw from that 
uh, you know, the water park picture uh, in the earlier presentation, which is pretty uh, remarkable, uh, but true. Um, but subsequently, we are seeing uh, strong recovery taking hold in other parts of Asia as well. The good thing is, is, is that as we went into the crisis at the beginning of the year, uh, as I mentioned, valuations were fairly uh, modest. So if you look at this picture of valuations of Asian equity markets, the red line uh, shows you the Asian equity market valuation from price to book perspective, which tends to be a somewhat stable measure of valuation compared to price earnings. And you compare that, you compare that against uh, uh, the other two lines, uh, one is Europe and one is uh, dark gray. You have the, the uh, you know, uh, US. You can see that despite the recovery that we have seen over the last few uh, months uh, in Asian markets, we are still slightly above historical average. And in fact, we are far below that of uh, US equity market. So this is still an asset class that one could decide to invest in at this point of time, taking a medium to long-term uh, horizon. Talking about the long-term, slide four shows you a little bit of a long-term picture of uh, both from an economic and a market perspective. So if you look at the red line, that is uh, the economic growth differential between emerging Asia versus developed markets. Whereas the light brown line on top shows you the market performance differential between emerging Asia and uh, developed uh, markets. What you can see is that both from an economic and a market perspective, the outperformance of Asia versus developed markets tend to come in long and deep cycles of about five to seven years each. And when uh, the economic performance is uh, increasing in favor of Asia, even markets uh, react accordingly. So Asian markets have also tended to outperform developed markets as their economies have done better than uh, developed markets, uh, I mean, the gap has been increasing. So you saw, um, you know, if you look at the latest part of the cycle since about 2010, you can see a broad downturn in this cycle as actually the economic growth gap between uh, Asia and developed markets was actually decreasing. And so was the stock market performance uh, driven primarily by the US. But this started to plateau out around 2016, 2017 is quite classic. These cycles usually last about five to seven years because they're driven by capital expenditure. But we are still, and we were expecting from 2016 to 17, a bit of an uptrend, a relative outperformance from an economic and market perspective for Asia. But that was put on hold, first because of Trump coming to power and starting the trade issues with China. And secondly, more recently due to the COVID outbreak. But we do expect that this could coming, continue going forward this relative outperformance of Asia versus uh, developed markets, because one of the reasons that these cycles have take five to seven years is because of the CapEx cycle. Capital expenditure happens in long and deep cycles of five to seven years each. It's a very classic uh, cycle for businesses to you know, uh, start investing when they see profits uh, and they invest, they invest a lot. There is overcapacity, the profits start to decline and businesses uh, you know, reduce their investment. This whole period takes about five to seven years. And you can see the dark line on slide five is the uh, capital expenditure in emerging markets, largely Asia, uh, which has been declining from about 2011 to about 2016, again, matching the downturn in the previous graphs that I showed you and started to plateau out in 2016, 17 and started to increase again, but was put on hold due to the Trump administration and then the COVID outbreak. So there are reasons. So the result of this is there is very little excess capacity in Asia, which is a good thing. And we could see going forward, uh, you know, CapEx is picking up. Balance sheets, company balance sheets. Uh, I mentioned that in my summary at the beginning are also quite sound in Asia. So slide six has two charts, as you see in front of you. On the left side, you have cash as a percentage of market capitalization. Again, if you focus on the red line, the dark red line, you'll see cash as a percentage of market cap has been increasing for Asian companies. This is partly a result of reduced capital expenditure that I just talked about. So basically, uh, cash on balance sheet is there, which means that many of these companies have been able to withstand the economic difficulty posed by uh, COVID and been able to withstand a nine to 12 month period of very difficult times, many companies 
uh, have been able to do that because of the cash on their balance sheets and the fact that debt on their balance sheet has also been brought down over the last 20 years, broadly speaking. If you again look at the dark red line on the uh, chart to your right, uh, debt to equity has been coming off for uh, most uh, or many, the large part of Asian companies, particularly in the listed space. Combining all these factors, along with the fact that these markets, particularly China, still remain uh, uh, a somewhat unresearched market, so the domestic China market is certainly so, uh, and also somewhat inefficient, driven a little bit more by sentiment, a uh, little bit more by uh, risk off and re, uh, risk on uh, sentiments across the globe, means that the swings in markets can be a little bit higher, but that actually from an investment perspective, for a long-term uh, investment perspective, for managers like ourselves, uh, provides an opportunity, right? So if you look at, provides an opportunity for active management to pick stocks at the right price, right? So if you look at what our portfolios have been able to deliver over a long period of time, an Asian equity portfolio on the left-hand side on slide seven shows you the red line that an actively managed portfolio in Asia can deliver very handsome returns, much above that of the index. So since we started this particular portfolio in end of 2014, the portfolio is up 112% as of end of September, whereas the MSCI Asia X Japan is only up 45%. So you can see the power of active management in the differential between these two lines. China is even more a starker story a stronger story and the domestic China A market is an even more stronger story. And here the power of active management is even higher because this is still an undiscovered market by many investors. It is gradually being included in global indices and getting known to foreign investors, especially outside Asia. Uh, so, and it is heavily driven by the retail investor, which means that, uh, you know, the, our ability to derive uh, relative performance, absolute and relative performance, compared to the index is pretty high here. And you can see that on the chart on the right, whereas over the last 13 years, since we incepted this particular portfolio, the MSCI China index or the broader market hasn't done that, uh, that, that well. I mean, it's done okay, 108% up in 13 years, nothing, nothing that great. However, an active managed portfolio like ours is up 519% on this, uh, on this basis. So what I've tried to emphasize with this chart is the power of active management. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the opportunity that exists in Asia to identify good companies and hold them for the long term and, uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, basically get performance for your portfolios, for your clients. That opportunity in Asia, I believe, or we believe, is certainly larger than in large parts of the developed markets where uh, you know, markets are much more efficient. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about the trends uh, that we see in Asia and how some of them are getting accelerated. Um, for that, we start with the economic trend. On slide eight, you see here a forecast which is done by the IMF fairly recently. This is just, uh, you know, it's, it's about a year ago. So this is before the COVID outbreak, but I think the picture is even stronger now. If you look at the left-hand side, you see a circle. And here you'll see that the IMF estimates about, if they look at global GDP growth over the next five years, they expect one third of that to be contributed to by China. In absolute terms, global GDP growth, one third coming from China over the next five years, they expect another close to 50% uh, to be coming from other emerging markets. And the rest, coming from US and Europe. So basically nearly 90% uh, or you know, uh, 80% of global growth over the next uh, five years is expected to come from emerging markets, driven by emerging markets. One of the reasons for that, and it's not the only reason, uh, but one of the reasons for that is that uh, these are markets which are still adding working age population. That's what the chart on the right shows you. The red lines above the zero above uh, above the zero axis uh, basically imply that working age population is being added and will continue to be added right up to 2050 and beyond in many parts of emerging Asia and many parts of emerging markets. Whereas the gray lines, which are already below the zero right now, uh, basically signify in developed markets, developed countries, uh, working age population is going down. 
Why is this relevant? Because the uh, working age population is a good indicator of population, which is of course working, but then earning and producing, and then finally consuming. So it is a driver of economic growth over the long term. And the nature of the economies uh, driven by this growth is however changing. It's not the same economy structure that we have today that we had 10 or 20 years ago. An interesting way of looking at this, one interesting way of looking at this on, on, on slide nine is the factor is how uh, the composition of the economy uh, as represented in this case by the market has changed over the last of the last 10 years or so in, uh, in uh, Asia, in emerging markets at large. So you can see here that certain areas of the economy have taken up market share and certain have lost market share. What we call old economy sectors like energy, materials, telecom sectors have lost market share hugely. Energy has gone from becoming 25% of the index, uh, broadly speaking, to less than 8% today. Whereas the space has been taken up by more new economy companies, new economy sectors, media, entertainment, uh, internet, you know, internet e-commerce, gaming, and consumption, broadly speaking, um, particularly discretionary consumption. That has really taken up uh, a bigger share of the economy as many economies move from being, uh, move more towards being driven by services and consumption. Banks also have increased their share of the overall economic pie. And these are the parts which are interesting for us to look deeper into and then uh, and find investment opportunities. Looking deeper into one of them, discretionary spending, uh, consumption broadly speaking, there are two trends here. Uh, one is in certain countries like China, a trend towards premiumization. What I mean by that is that Whereas the overall category, consumption category might not be increasing in a certain area. For example, let's take cars, may not be growing at a, at a very high rate every year uh, anymore in certain countries uh, or domestic liquor. Um, that's what the chart on the top shows you. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you see that bar showing 0.2%, which means that the domestic liquor uh, category in China, uh, a particular one called Baiju is barely growing. It's growing, it's flat. However, what we see in many of these consumption categories is a trend towards premiumization, which means that people with extra income, they are going up the value scale and switching to better quality goods and products and services. And so you can see the ultra premium end of that growing at about 17% per annum, whereas uh, you know, the lower end of that is barely growing. So, uh, and this is happening across a number of items. It is happening in cars. It is happening in dairy products. It is happening in liquor. Uh, and with the COVID outbreak, this also gets accelerated because the consciousness towards safety, security, cleanliness, and hygiene has probably gone up. So you're going to be wanting better quality goods and services, particularly if it's something you consume. The second phenomena here is discretionary spending. And you can see that on the chart on the left, how in this case, India, the wallet share spent on, on the left-hand side, food, beverage, and tobacco has uh, declined dramatically uh, between 2000 and 2019, the last 20 years, from above 45% to about 30% today. So out of your wallet, instead of you were spending 45% on food, clothing, and shelter, today you spent 30%. On the other hand, the items which have gone up are transport and communication, services, education, recreation, Tra travel, leisure, tourism. And this is happening across a number of countries. As people's are, incomes are increasing, they're spending more of that income, not on basic food, clothing, and shelter, but more on education, healthcare, leisure activities, travel, tourism, et cetera. The next slide is, uh, is, is, is kind of a repeat of what I showed you earlier, the trend towards premiumization. So I'll skip that and move on to another trend that I talked about, which is getting accelerated because of the COVID outbreak, which is increasing spending on R&D. And here you have two charts. And uh, again, we take the example of China, which is really the leader in this area, where you can see that um, on the left-hand side, the spending on R&D uh, by China over the last 10 years has gone up by four times. It's second only to the US in absolute terms now. 
right? So a huge amount of spending on R&D. And this is resulting in international patent applications and international patents being granted across a number of areas. So it's, 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 it's you know, robotics, automation, telecom equipment, um, you know, biotech, healthcare, a lot of areas where this is being manifest. And the chart on the right actually shows you the result of this R&D spending in terms of international patent applications. And the international patent grants chart is also very similar. But China uh, does have some problems as well, right? I mean, the, 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 the chart I showed you about working age population increasing does not apply to China. China is growing by, by, by virtue of different drivers, a move away from investment driven growth to services and consumption driven growth, increasing spending on R&D and uh, R&D automation and technology. Uh, but it is facing the challenge of aging population, aging demographics. So you can see on this slide on the top on 13, how China will be adding the most number of people, not only in absolute terms, uh, to the above 65 year old cohort, but also the growth of this portion for China is going to be the highest in percentage terms among any major country. So that's a challenge for social security systems and other areas, but it is also an opportunity in the case of China. Healthcare services, healthcare spending is going up very rapidly across uh, private individuals, uh, companies and, and the government that is expected to uh, you know, triple over the next 10 years. Uh, insurance, services, insurance, life insurance uh, purchases are going up from a very low base. As the country go grows old, as it grows rich, the desire to save for the next generation is higher. Uh, the de desire to protect wealth is higher. And so things like uh, life insurance, uh, asset management, wealth management, brokerage services are also seeing a great opportunity going forward. Moving on beyond China, in fact, the trend I'm going to talk about now does not apply as much to China is the underpenetration of credit across a number of Asian economies. This underpenetration of credit is there in, uh, in countries like India, in countries like Indonesia, and these are the two largest countries within Asia, at least, where credit penetration is still low, but is increasing through the use of government driven measures, but also through the use of technology. And so many more uh, people are coming into the formal credit system or the formal financial system. Uh, there's been a huge increase uh, in this number in India, for example, over the last uh, four years. And these are people who are then consuming financial services, but also consuming other products and services. And this is an opportunity for certain banks in some of these countries, which is a, a very powerful investment theme over the next five years, even though this is a sector which is slightly negatively impacted this year. So in the short term, there are some challenges still, but over the long term, I think uh, you know banks, particularly if you speak the good quality ones, are, 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 are a good opportunity. And lastly, before I come to the end of my presentation is technology, but from a different angle. I'm not talking here about uh, internet, you know, services, uh, internet e-commerce, but I'm talking about hardware, uh, semiconductors. And this is again, another uh, opportunity because this is an industry which has consolidated hugely globally uh, over the years because the capital expenditure requirement to produce the next uh, level of uh, semiconductor chip has gone up a lot. So over the last 10 years, uh, you'll see that the number of players uh, has actually diminished. And now there are about three or four global players uh, worldwide. Uh, and so the remaining players are benefiting from this. And also the increasing use of uh, the semiconductor, semiconductor chips and memory by new services like client computing, uh, autonomous driving, autonomous vehicles, uh, internet of things, et cetera. So this remains an interesting area to watch out for. This is a little bit impacted by what's happening between US and China, but while there are some negative impacts, there are also positive impacts coming out from this as some countries like China think about building national champions in this area uh, to reduce their reliance on uh, foreign countries. So with this, I'll take a pause and uh, you know, uh, perhaps hand it back to, uh, to Greg, and uh, you know, hopefully answer a few questions that you might have. Thank you. 
Thanks, Brigitte. And that's really interesting and a much different perspective than we got for the most part from Dr. Mohada's presentation. So really a nice compliment to that. The, the one thing that I, that, that a couple of things that jumped out to me, um, you know, that, that statistic that you mentioned that about 80% of global growth over the next five years will be driven by emerging markets. Um, and China being one third of that, and I would assume a lot of that also coming out of emerging markets in Asia, what does that mean for, if you can, if you can capsulize it, I guess, what does that mean for financial institutions in terms of their level of assets, their level of revenue and credit and, and everything else? I would, I would assume that only means that their growth likely coincides with that. Um, broadly speaking, that is true. However, there are different phenomena, different trends playing out in different countries, right? So for example, um, in China, while the broader, uh, you know, there will be credit growth and there will be economic growth, uh, we have already seen that credit growth over the last 10, 20 years has been pretty strong in China. So the opportunity set for the financial sector while still there is perhaps uh, not as large as it is for countries like, um, like India and Indonesia, and, and, and maybe perhaps Philippines with large population, with underbanked populations, which are coming into the fold. So yes, financial institutions will benefit, but in different cases, it could be different. So for example, again, coming back to China, it could be the state-owned banks which benefit more from this overall phenomena, could be. Uh, in the case of India and Indonesia, what we see is private sector banks, particularly in the case of India, getting more and more share from the public sector. And here we see some great opportunities in the, in the top quality private sector banks. So definitely when you combine this picture with what's going on on the technology front, it is uh, an opportunity for uh, financial institutions who can marry these two together, the economic growth, the financial offering and the technological interface with the user, right? Uh, so definitely it's an, op it's an option, uh, it's an opportunity that we uh, you know, try and uh, invest in. Question that we have from uh, one of our uh, attendees, they want to know which sector has the most impact on the Asian economy and what should the future strategy be based on that? Um, so which sector has the most impact? I would say still today, uh, the financial sector is certainly one of the largest sectors. It tend to be, if you talk about the economy, uh, then the financial sector tends to be most directly linked to the economy. Number one, it is still the largest uh, sector within the economy. Uh, and secondly, the cycles of the financial sector tend to follow very closely with what's happening in the economy as, the, as, a, as a whole. It's most directly linked. But if you really talk about where we see the opportunities going forward, which sectors, I would still say that one of the stronger themes that is going to drive the opportunity set for us is going to be digital transformation. This might not be about a single sector, but this could span a number of sectors. So whichever company in many sectors uh, takes advantage of this uh, in a proper way might uh, stand to benefit and, 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 and drive, uh, you know, uh, drive returns for, for a portfolio. So over the last 10 years, uh, this has clearly been uh, you know, the, the, the internet and e-commerce sector, which you can, which is kind of meshing together with consumption at some level, right? So Alibaba, for instance, used to be considered an IT company a couple of years, till a couple of years ago. Today, it's uh, considered, uh, it's classified as a consumer company. So the biggest opportunity is in this intersection of consumption and technology. And finance is, is one part of it as well. These are the three, uh, you know, I, I would say technology, finance, consumption, broadly speaking, offer some of the best uh, opportunities and would drive uh, a lot of what's happening in economies going forward. And I wanna to say to uh, Lenny, if you wanna jump in on, on any of these questions, please feel free to do so. And, and this one, it may be more geared towards you, but it may also, Prajit, you may have a thought on it as well. But Andrian asks, what about the credit consumption and utilization in the Philippines? I guess he asking there, where do you see that going? So I'm afraid I, I, I do not have as um, detailed uh, a cut or let's say updated a knowledge on that to, to give a good answer on, on that one. So I will uh, I probably have to pass that one. Okay. 
Um, we have a question from uh, Jerry who asks, uh, Mr. Prajit, can you give us ways on how to reconfigure, and this is another one, Lenny, you might want to jump in on, can you give us ways on how to reconfigure our credit union operations to recover from losses in 2020? And again, Lenny, if you feel that's more geared towards, towards you, I know that, uh, that these are all subjects that have been coming up for your members here in, in the Asian Confederation as well. Yes, thank you very much, Greg. Um, the, the, the way I see it is that uh, our credit union should be able to be watching out what is the trend because it's very good that Prajit has already given us a very big, but very wide impact on the economy and the trends of how people change, to change of wallet of the people and trends in the demographics. I think that's an opportunity for us to take advantage of. It's also good to know that in Asia, we have, um, we, you know, our, our growth is still promising compared with other develop, developed uh, countries. Uh, the credit unions has to be very much uh, risk relevant and they need to be responding. Like for example, right now, what we are experiencing in the credit unions is that we have an over liquidity. Um, maybe it's uh, surprising, but it credit unions are, are experiencing over liquidity. We thought that we will have short of liquidity because members ability to pay have been impacted by, by the pandemic. But I think we need to, to look at, you know, helping our members to, to, to start their business again, helping the members to, to regain employment and to, to, to involve, uh, to, to be economically active by uh, helping them or, or giving them coaching on business. Um, I think the credit union should be very much engaged now and uh, cooperate each other in order to uh, really go into digital transformation because that would be the future. Very good. Uh, Sanjiwa has a question and, and this might be more in Prajit's uh, uh, category, but wants to know what would be the conditions and, and, and I guess with Sri Lanka, you would consider an emerging economy, but what are the conditions facing a country like Sri Lanka when it comes to the economic and development aspects they're going to be facing here over the next five years? I, I think uh, many countries are in a very similar uh, category. I mean, um, if you look at, and Sri Lanka is not that different from some of the other South Asian countries in terms of their, uh, you know, uh, let's say balance overall uh, as a country, the balance sheet. Um, and, and so it's been it's, it's always a challenge for uh, emerging countries to navigate difficult times uh, because it does put a stress on their uh, fiscal and uh, let's say monetary, uh, on, on the monetary side. So it's just something that has to be carefully nav navigated. I see Sri Lanka as being no particularly different or in much more trouble than other countries, in fact, in, 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 in South Asia. China and North Asia tends to stand out a little bit compared to the rest. So there, you know, the ability to spend, the ability to have much more sound or balance sheets from a government perspective is a little bit uh, higher, but that has been built up over the years. So if you look at the overall spectrum of Asian countries, there are some which are considered more not emerging. So, you know, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, you know, Taiwan and Korea. And, and China probably following next to that, but broadly speaking, the others are in a somewhat similar, uh, you know, bucket of having, uh, let's say, uh, some vulnerabilities, particularly when there is a risk of situation and can, you know, and and uh, capital tends to flow out of these countries. Uh, Indonesia has been one of them. Uh, Sri Lanka certainly uh, would fall in the same category, as in certain cases would be India. So it's just. I don't have a, a recipe for this. I, I just think that it is gradual, uh, you know, balanced, sound, uh, you know, macroeconomic uh, management, uh, which one has to, you know, do, but keeping in mind that you might have to do a little bit more uh, in, in difficult times like this year. So of course you'll be running a, you know, much more of a budget deficit this year than you would normally because you have to help out the local economies 
Uh, you have to help out businesses. You have to give subsidies. You have to give tax breaks. And that does put a little bit of pressure. So there's no um, you know, easy way out of it. But uh, if you don't you know, continue these policies for too long, you should be fine. So one of the classic issues here is to be able to uh, gradually normalize your policies and not uh, stay where you are uh, in case, for example, you were doing a lot of subsidies and tax cuts, but to bring them back to uh, normal over a, over a reasonable time frame. Okay, and uh, a reminder for folks, uh, I know some people have asked about these presentations. Uh, this entire webinar will be on the World Council YouTube channel uh, later tonight, probably there in Asia or early morning when you get up tomorrow. Um, that's world, that's uh, youtube.com slash woku, youtube.com slash W-O-C-C-U. Um, we got time for just one more question. Um, and this is probably more directed at you, Lenny. Um, Ranjan writes, Nepal also suffers from high liquidity and digital transformation is a big challenge here. How can we energize Nepalese credit unions and the Nepalese credit union system? Any suggestions? Yeah, thank, thanks very much for that question. Um, I think uh, it's quite a tough one. We really need we really need to talk a lot. We need we really need to to engage the credit union leaders so that they will be looking the same way as we do. I think the National Federation has a lot of role in order to uh, create an awareness. Yes, we need to cooperate with one another because we have been talking that for quite a long time. It's not only in Nepal, but it's also uh, within our member countries. Uh, like for example, I can say that in the Philippines, yes, they have been, to some extent, they have a level of success in uh, digitizing the, the, you know, the operations of credit unions uh, through the Kaya payment platform, but still we have a lot of work to do. So we need to engage all the top leaders of the credit unions in order for us to act collectively. I think that's the most important thing to do this time. All right, that actually does bring us to the end of the questions that we had from our attendees. Uh, I wanted to thank both of you. Prajit, thank you so much of UBS Global Management, or Global Asset Management, and also, as you know, uh, many of you know, uh, Lenny Senroque, uh, the CEO from the Asian Confederation of Credit Unions. And we also want to thank the National Credit Union Federation of Korea. Dr. Yun Sik Kim is actually the uh, chair of our COVID-19 Response Committee at the World Council. So. This has been, uh, this is actually the, now the fourth uh, uh, virtual financial symposium that we have done uh, through uh, World Council's COVID-19 Response Committee. We wanna thank everybody who's been uh, with us throughout this and played such a big part in it. And again, go to our YouTube channel if you want to see a broadcast or a recording of this and you can find that again at youtube.com slash Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>